Antiques Roadshow is a television show that began as a BBC documentary in 1977. Uh, From 1979 and following, it became an ongoing, still has not ceased, television show that has spawned versions of itself in a number of different countries, including the United States. If you've seen the show, you know that a panel of experts will get together and decide whether the rusty trinkets you found in Grandpa's garage are worth something or not. Well, the chapter of the Bible we're going to be looking at this morning is something like an episode of Antiques Roadshow, except what is up for valuation is not some knockoff vase hand-painted in the 1970s to resemble some uh, exquisite vase from the Ming Dynasty, not some replica sword being passed off as General Custard's trusty blade. Now, what's on display, what is on the block, what is up for valuation in Ecclesiastes chapter 2 is life itself. Life is being evaluated. Everything under the sun is under inspection in this chapter of our Bible. We know that in the first 11 verses, we looked at this a few weeks ago, Solomon experimented with sex, drugs, and rock and roll, home improvement, materialism, and his own reputation. He found them wanting in their ability to produce enduring joy, happiness, satisfaction, and fulfillment. And now in verses 12 to 26, the text we'll look at this morning, Solomon turns to the underlying components underneath his experiment. We're going to look this morning at wisdom and hard work. And he holds them up and turns them over in his mind, examines them, evaluates them, discovers what they are worth. Nothing. Floxy, nasi, nihila, pilification. If you were wondering how to pronounce the title of this morning's sermon, it doesn't matter, it doesn't mean anything, or rather it means nothing. Every piece of that word, floxy, nasi, nihili, pilification, all of it means nothing, and it's one gigantic word, the second longest word in the English language, composed to describe nothing. It's the valuation of something as worthless, as valueless. Solomon, in this part of this book, is evaluating life. Let's read it together. Verses 12 to 26 of Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Here is God's word through the pen of Solomon. So I turned to consider wisdom, madness, and folly. For what will the man do who will come after the king except what has already been done? And I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I know that one fate befalls them both. Then I said to myself, as is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? So I said to myself, this too is vanity. For there is no lasting remembrance of the wise man as with the fool, inasmuch as in the coming days all will be forgotten, and how the wise man and the fool alike die. So I hated life. For the work which had been done under the sun was grievous to me, because everything is futility and striving after wind. Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor for which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. This too is vanity. Therefore, I completely despaired of all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun. When there is a man who has labored with wisdom and knowledge and skill, and then he gives his legacy to one who has not labored with them, this too is vanity and a great evil. For what does man get in all of his labor and in his striving with which he labors under the sun? Because all his days his task is painful and grievous. Even at night his mind does not rest. This too is vanity. There is no good in man that he could eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This also I have seen that it is from the hand of God. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? 
For to a person who is good in his sight, he has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. While to the sinner, he has given the task of gathering and collecting so that he may give to the one who is good in God's sight. This too is vanity and striving after wind. Will you pray with me? God, we come to this most discouraging book in your book, this most discouraging text this morning, a text about grief and labor upon labor and toil and despair and vanity and chasing after wind. And we long to engage with this text. Oh, Lord, let us feel what Adam lost. Let us yearn for what you alone provide. I pray this morning that you would use this text to shake us, to grant to us an eternal perspective, to think rightly about life under the sun and to long for you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Solomon in this passage describes the futility of life under the sun and he explains its source. We're going to look this morning at his description and explanation of the futility of our existence under the sun. First, let's look at the futility of wisdom. This occurs in verses 12 to 17. Solomon had employed wisdom. You know that he was intelligent and he was wise and God gave him more wisdom. And with his natural wisdom and his God-given wisdom, he pursued more wisdom. In every area of life, he searched things out, and he decided to use his great, indomitable brain to find the meaning of life, bypassing what true wisdom is, beginning and ending with the fear of the Lord. He sought to find out independently what life was all about. He used his wisdom to look for meaning in pleasure, in intellect, in materialism, in all of those elements of his experiment we looked at a few weeks ago. All of that failed. His grand experiment to find the meaning in life was a, an abject failure, and now he's asking base questions underneath his experiment. Maybe I went about this all wrong. I, I used wisdom to try to find meaning in life. Maybe there's something wrong with wisdom itself. He's asking about the value of wisdom. His incomparable wisdom could not give him an answer to the question found in chapter 1, verse 3. What profit, what gain, what transcendent advantage is there to the sons of men under the sun? What's the bottom line? Wisdom couldn't get me together. Maybe wisdom itself is flawed. Look at verse 12. He says, so I turned. Literally, I, I turned my back on that experiment, and, and now I turned to face the reality underneath it. To the basis of the experiment, can, can human thinking at its very best even get me the answers I'm looking for? And so I contrasted wisdom with madness and folly. Madness and folly go together and they're contrasted with wisdom. And by wisdom here again, Solomon does not mean what begins with the fear of the Lord as he himself defined wisdom in the book of Proverbs. But here, human contemplation at its best, a skillful employment of information for success in an endeavor a horizontal view of wisdom, good, virtuous, practical thinking. That's what Solomon has in mind here. And he says, no one can test wisdom better than I have, verse 12, for what will the man do who will come after the king except what has already been done? No one could match Solomon for smarts. No one could touch Solomon for resources. He tried it. He exhausted the experiment. Nobody's going to get any farther than I did. The wisest, smartest, best-funded thinking man the world has ever known could not wrestle from life its fundamental meaning, its transcendent purpose. If Solomon couldn't find the answer, then who will? Could any successor do better? Solomon says no. Did Solomon miss something in his experiment? Can, can someone after him find something under the sun that Solomon failed to examine? Something that might fulfill the quest for profit? for gain or transcendent advantage or meaning. So Solomon throws his hands up. Maybe the answer cannot be found with wisdom. Verses 13 and 14, he just can't quite bring himself to equate wisdom and foolishness. Look what he says. 
I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. No one can deny wisdom's relative superiority over folly. And we see this throughout the Bible, throughout the wisdom literature in the Bible. We see it also in Ecclesiastes, in Ecclesiastes 2.3, Solomon gives wisdom credit for guiding men. That wisdom is good and advantageous in chapter 7, verse 11. Wisdom is profitable for protection of life in 7.12, for strength in 7.19. Wisdom is a grid for evaluating the circumstances around you in 7.23. Wisdom itself is a source of joy in 8.1. Wisdom is superior to brute strength, even for rescuing a whole city against an enemy in chapter 9. And wisdom is the giver of success in many earthly circumstances, chapter 10, verse 10. In fact, the difference between wisdom and folly is like the difference between night and day, between light and darkness. The fool bumbles and stumbles around through life like we stumble through our own familiar spaces when the power goes out. Clearly, it's better to see. Wisdom is better than folly. There's great advantage to being wise. But what is the gain? What is the profit? What is the takeaway if the second half of verse 14 is true? The wise and the foolish, one fate befalls them both. By fate here, Solomon does not mean random chance, but a happening, an event that was unexpected to the participant, anything but random. In fact, this word is used throughout Scripture to describe what God himself does and is in charge of, things that are planned but unexpected to some of the participants until they occur. In verse 14, death is the great equalizer. But why should I be wise when the wise and the foolish both end up dead? You see, you can be eaten by a great white shark with your eyes open or with your eyes closed. It doesn't really matter if you're wearing a blindfold or not. The thoughtful man recognizes the meaninglessness of life. The naive man still thinks that meaning is to be found under the sun, so he gropes about in a futile search for what will never be found. It cannot be found because it is not there. It's as if a great asteroid is on a trajectory to make impact with the earth and totally obliterate our planet. Now, would you rather be the astronomer who sees it coming, plotting its course, taking its measurements, performing spectral analysis with your forehead stuck to the eyepiece of a telescope, watching this extraterrestrial rock grow bigger and bigger and bigger until... Or... Would you rather be a cow in a field, happy as ever to get one more mouthful of sweet blue Kentucky grass into one of the four compartments in your stomach, totally oblivious to the doom? The great thinkers of our world are probably more like Solomon. They would much rather have their eyes open to the meaninglessness of life. life. They would much rather know than not know that death is coming which will in the end make all of their thoughts pointless and all of their accomplishments meaningless. The discovery of the meaninglessness of life is itself meaninglessness. Look at verse 15. Then I said to myself, as is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? So I said to myself, this too is hevel, vanity, emptiness. This has in fact been the conclusion of many intellectual giants under our sun. Martin Heidegger is said to be one of the most important philosophers of the 20th century. He claimed that if people stopped long enough to think about their mortality, they should plod through a state of ceaseless, wrenching, existential despondency regarding the inevitable closing of their eyes. Only a blithe simpleton would enjoy the world rather than be anguished. Solomon asks, why go to all the trouble of pursuing wisdom? Floxy, nasi, nihila, pilification. The estimation of all of it as valueless, as worthless. But maybe after I die, my wisdom can outlive me. Maybe my ideas or or my thoughts can, can get farther than I do. Maybe I can leave a legacy. 
Verse 16, for there is no lasting remembrance of the wise man as with the fool, inasmuch as in the coming days all will be forgotten, and how the wise man and the fool alike die. Can Solomon's ideas transcend his departure and the memories of those who will come after me? Can any wise man have a confidence in his legacy? And Solomon says no. Now we're reading Solomon's words. What has been preserved for us? That which God wanted recorded. Solomon says you will be forgotten and you will be dead. Where are Solomon's works on botany? architecture, all those things that the world streamed to ask him tough questions about. Where are all those things? Alexandria's great ancient library, a wealth of literature and thought from the ancient world, was burned and destroyed over the course of several major military battles. And most libraries don't burn down. Most are buried, buried by books that never get read The academic world today is a a collection of dust that settles on this life work of scholars entombed in the basements of some dusty library. And the only person who's ever going to blow off the dust of some of these life works of some of the greatest minds and read them is some newfangled upstart academician, whatever, student (laughs) trying to make a name for himself by debunking the forgotten scholar's work. They get buried and lost, forgotten. Besides, what good is it to be remembered if you're not there to appreciate it? There's no lasting meaning in this. Thomas Scott was a pastor who died in 1821. He said on his deathbed, posthumous reputation, the veriest bubble with which the devil ever deluded a wretched mortal. (laughs) He said to be truly useful for eternity. Now that was something. But to have your ideas and your reputation live past you, it's a lie, it's fleeting. What a delusion to think that transcendent satisfaction is to be found in having your intellectual meanderings regurgitated by subsequent mortals under the same curse who will tire themselves after you on the same hamster wheel that you wore out, searching and searching but never finding the meaning of life. Not a great legacy. Albert Einstein and Pee Wee Herman both end up six feet under and mostly forgotten. Look at verse 17. So I hated life. For the work I had poured my life into, the work which had been done under the sun, was grievous to me. Everything futility and chasing after wind. Everything that Solomon was about Everything he went after was a bust, and he is cursing the very things he threw his whole life at. It's like Michael Jordan saying, I hate basketball, or Michael Phelps saying, I hate swimming, or me saying, I hate running. No, wait a second, I actually do hate running. But notice in verse 17, he he doesn't say, and so I hated my life. No, he just says, I hated life. He hated life itself. He he hated the whole enterprise. And he dares to speak on behalf of all who ever experienced life in a cursed universe. He says everything is futility and striving after wind. Bertrand Russell was a 20th century mathematician and philosopher. As a young man, he so deeply despaired over the meaninglessness of life that he contemplated suicide. The only thing he says that kept him from killing himself was the working out of math problems that interested him. He wrote a book called The Conquest of Happiness, and in it he puts out his recipe for finding meaning and happiness and enduring satisfaction in life. He rejected God outright and independently sought to find happiness for himself. I read the book about 10 years ago, and his bottom line answer is you need to live a sober, non-exciting, quiet balanced life. If you get drunk, you're, you're missing the point. You're just escaping. If you chase after excitement, you dull your senses to what is really delightful. Real delight is to be found in sobriety, boring, easy, quiet, simplicity. It doesn't sound like much of an answer to me. It certainly was not an answer for Bertrand Russell. The people closest to him, one of his many witnesses, uh, 
one of his many mistresses, reported that he did not find happiness himself. And he made everyone around him as miserable as he was. His life was a train wreck of immorality, disaster, and pain. He, never, he was a hypocrite. He never found what he tells the rest of us how to get. Men set out to search for it under the sun, and they never find it. And death shuts the door on any hope that any man might stumble across some answer to life's vexing question. We are all alike under the curse. We are all alike under the sentence of death. Go back and read Genesis chapter 5. Just shortly after the fall of man, we read these words. Adam lived, and he died. Seth lived, and he died. Enosh lived, and he died. Kenan lived, and he died. Your name belongs on that list. Voltaire said, I hate life, and yet I'm afraid to die. If death has the last word, then every under-the-sun pursuit, every philosophy of life, every thinker and all his thoughts come to a brutal final end. One writer put it this way, if every card in our hand will be trumped, does it matter how we play? The wise, the fool. And for all of its relative superiority to foolishness, wisdom, says Solomon, is simply a more elegant zero. It can't bring about the answers to life. And Solomon says he got to the point where he hated life. You know what this tells me? The curse worked. The curse worked. But when mankind rejected God, the giver of all good things, and, and sought wisdom and knowledge and joy independently, God said to the creation and to mankind, the created order will not yield what you seek from it. You try to squeeze meaning and satisfaction and fulfillment out of this broken life which God himself cursed and you will never find what you're looking for. God has reprogrammed the created order so as not to yield what men think they want to get out of it. As long as they reject God, as long as they go after these things independently, they will never get what they seek. The curse works. God's judgment against sin accomplished what he intended. The creation is frustrated, unable to yield satisfaction, and death, the fate that awaits everyone who lives, Everything done under the sun is done under God's curse, and Solomon feels it deeply. He moves from the futility of wisdom, secondly, to the futility of work, beginning in verse 18. This is a description of the rat race, labor, work, effort, toil. Did you hear the emotion in Solomon's words here in this passage? Beginning in verse 18, I hated the labor for which I have labored. Verse 19, again, the labor for which I have labored, vanity. Verse 20, I completely despaired over the labor for which I had labored. Verse 21, vanity, great evil. Verse 22, labor and striving with which he labors. Verse 23, painful, grievous, vanity. Now Solomon is either a drama queen or he's on to something. He's thought more thoroughly about life than most of us do normally. And many people attempt to find their significance in their occupation and what they do for a living. In fact, it's often the first question we ask one another when we meet. So what do you do? And Solomon here says he hates it. Verse 18, thus I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun. In verse 17, he said he hated life because of his labor, and here now he even hates the fruits of his labor for which he had labored. Why? The first thing on Solomon's mind here in verse 18 is that he has to leave the fruits of it to someone else. He spent his life amassing things he cannot keep. Someone asked Rockefeller's estate manager, so how much did he leave? The estate manager replied, all of it. King Tutankhamun, the pharaoh over Egypt, he left all of his stuff too. 
And maybe there's the thought that if I don't last and, and maybe if people forget me, then my possessions will outlive me. They will still be here. Maybe there's meaning to be found in, in passing those on and in, in leaving an inheritance. Solomon organizes the problems of leaving an inheritance. He says, number one, you can't control it. Number two, the inheritor could be foolish. Number three, the inheritor didn't earn it. These are all problems with leaving your stuff. Look at verse 19. Who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool? Yet he will have control over all the fruit of my labor for which I have labored by acting wisely under the sun. This too is vanity. Jerome said, one has the fruit of another's labor and the sweat of the dead is the ease of the one who lives. In verse 20. He says, therefore, I completely despaired. Literally, he says, so I turned my heart over to despair over all of the toil that I toiled under the sun. Here Solomon draws himself into his own misery, thinking about the moral calamity of someone else getting for nothing what he worked so hard to achieve. Do you remember how many times in chapter 2 Solomon said, I built for myself, I made for myself, I purchased for myself. And now some entitled, whiny, privileged loaf who never worked a day in his life is going to get all the fruit of my labor. Verse 21, he calls this a vanity and a great evil. When there is a man who has labored with wisdom and knowledge and skill and then he gives his legacy to one who has not labored with them, this is vanity and great evil. And notice that Solomon lamenting work here is is not one who's just going to work, punching a time clock, can't wait till it's done. He's not working for the weekend. He doesn't have Monday morning blues, and he doesn't say TGIF. No, Solomon loved his work, and he poured everything he had into his endeavors. He set his whole heart to squeezing happiness out of his work. But the question from chapter 1 went unanswered, despite all of his toil. And he asks it again in verse 22, What does a man get in all of his labor? in all of his striving with which he labors under the sun. What's the bottom line? Where is the gain? Where is the profit, the transcendent value? Solomon's own son, Rehoboam, was a fool. In 1 Kings 12, you can read how in a very short period of time, Rehoboam split the kingdom and took all that Solomon had laid up for him and ruined it, squandered it. This was painful, grievous to Solomon. And the toil in giving it is, in getting it is on display in verse 23. Because all the man's days, his task is painful and grievous. Even at night, his mind does not rest. This too is vanity. This is the rat race. You work hard during the day, your mind is racing at night. And for what? What is the reward that wise labor produced? Pain in the toil? uncertainty in the outcome. The workaholic with relentless ambition for whom business is a God. It's just a lot of hamster wheel running. No destination is ever reached. Your dose of 20th century poetic musing this morning comes from Boston. This is a recognition of the futility of the rat race and an expression of the desire to get off the hamster wheel. Now, if you're feeling kind of low about the dues you've been paying, future's coming much too slow, and you want to run, but somehow you just keep on staying, can't decide on which way to go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have to read the yes. I understand about indecision, but I don't care if I get behind. People living in competition, all I want is to have my peace of mind. Now you're climbing to the top of the company ladder. Hope it doesn't take too long. Can't you see there will come a day when it won't matter? Come a day when you'll be gone. I understand about indecision. I don't care if I get behind people living in competition. All I want is to have my peace of mind. Some worship the grind and happiness eludes them. Others reject the rat race and the answers are still fleeting. Wise living and hard work are not the answers to life. Wait a second, Solomon. You're maligning good things here. 
You're talking about thinking well and working hard, and, and you're saying that they're worthless. And Solomon is driving us to despair, even over the best things this life has to offer. Even over all moral or neutral or even good things. We are to despair over their inability to give us what we need most. You and I were created to transcend the stuff of this earth. Another poet, a believer, said, The stuff of earth competes for the allegiance I owe only to the giver of all good things. You see, only when we are rightly related to our creator will we ever have access to true joy, lasting significance, and enduring satisfaction. Everything short of God that promises these things is a lie and a cheat. And Solomon learned to despair over life because he set his gaze on the horizontal. He worshipped and served the created thing rather than the creator. And until that fundamental relationship between God and a man is set right, a man will forever be in the hunt for what cannot be found. A tantalizing chase that culminates in bitter disillusionment and a brutal end. That is the futility of work. In verses 24 to 26, Solomon gives explanation of the futility. The futility of his experiment in the first part of the chapter, the, ex the futility of wisdom itself, the futility of work. Why is life a vain pursuit of what cannot be caught? He explains it in verses 24 to 26. He says, first of all, in verse 24, there is no good in man that he could eat and drink and cause his soul to see good in his labor. This I have seen is from the hand of God. And this verse, Ecclesiastes 2.24, is critical to understanding this chapter. I believe it's critical to understanding this book. I think it's critical to understanding the theme of the Bible. This verse is critical for your understanding of who you are and where you fit in the universe and what life is all about. It reveals what is wrong with life. Because it reveals what is wrong with us. And we need to talk a little bit about the translation of Ecclesiastes 2.24. Almost all English versions of the Bible render this verse something like the New American Standard. Which says, there is nothing better for a man to do than to eat and drink and tell himself that his labor is good. This is from God. You have to know our English translations are really good. The, the family of Bible translations that you and I get to read in the English are the best the world has ever known. They're exceptional. You can trust your English Bible. But they are translations. And anytime you translate from one language to another, things can be lost, things can be misunderstood. This is why preaching is, is, is important. This is why pastors and missionaries spend lots of time studying Greek and Hebrew so that they can understand What's beneath our English translations? I want to suggest something uh, that I don't want to do often. It's very rare that our English texts miss the point of a passage. It might even get sort of the opposite meaning. And it's rarer still that almost every English translation gets it wrong. Uh, I, I'm not the kind of guy that wants to stand up and say every week, English has it wrong, trust me, I know Greek, or whatever. I, I think that does damage to the value that we have in our English Bibles. But hang with me for just a moment. I think this is important enough to maybe draw a line through verse 24 and scribble something in the margin. Okay, first what I want to do is give you the, the uh, English translations that are out there. ESV says there's nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. Holman Christian Standard. There is nothing better for man than to eat, drink, and enjoy his work. New, uh, New International Version. A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. King James. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. New Revised Standard, there's nothing better for mortals than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in their toil. New Century Version, the best that people can do is eat and drink and enjoy their work. New Living Translation, I decided there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in work. 
the Net Bible. There is nothing better for people than to eat and drink and find enjoyment in work. Good News Bible, the best thing anyone can do is to eat and drink and enjoy what he has earned. And the message, the best you can do with your life is have a good time and get by the best you can. The way I see it, that's it, divine fate. Okay, you see sort of a range of translations. They all start with the same premise. There's one English translation I could find that I think reflects the original. This is the Young's literal translation. There is nothing good in a man who eateth and hath drunk and hath shewn his soul good in his labor. And I'll give you my translation on the screen. It's there for you. There is no good in man that he could eat and drink and cause his soul to see good in his labor. This also I have seen that it is from the hand of God. Those are two very different translations. One says, the best thing you can do, eat, drink, enjoy your work. And the Hebrew text says, man doesn't have it in him to eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. Man doesn't have the capacity for enjoyment in any transcendent or enduring way. It's not actually in man to do these things. To eat and drink and be merry, to, to get satisfaction out of your work. Now, listen carefully. Solomon is going to go down that road. In fact, you can write down 312, 322, and 815, or wait till we get there. Because <laughs> Solomon is going to say that when God gives these good gifts, they are to be enjoyed. And one rightly related to him has a newfound capacity for the enjoyment of them. But he's not ready for that argument yet. I think one of the reasons all the English uh, verses change verse 24 is to reflect the truths that Solomon will get to later. And they're true. But he's not there yet. And what he wants to point out first is man's depravity. Man's inability. Man's brokenness. The ability for enjoyment is not inherent in man. Man is inherently wicked and bent and broken. And ever since the fall, we have been separated from that which brings satisfaction. Separated from that which provides transcendent happiness. Good things and the capacity for transcendent enjoyment of them come only from God. And here's a key to the whole book, verse 25. For who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him, without God? And the answer to the question is nobody. Gifts come from him. The ability to enjoy those gifts come from him. You can't have them independently. This is the theme of Ecclesiastes. You cannot enjoy life until you choose to enjoy God. The ultimate futility in life is the frustrating failure to find fulfillment Especially frustrating when those things are good and beautiful and gifts from God, but they won't yield satisfaction without Him. Men try and try and try to squeeze satisfaction and meaning out of things that God graciously gives, but they just can't get it. It's like having a can of cold, sweet peaches on a hot day, but no can opener. And no utensil. And no teeth no taste buds, and no mouth. What good is the can of peaches? Trying to get satisfaction out of a broken world in a man without the capacity to enjoy it is like trying to get water from a stone, blood from a turnip, honey from the rock. By the way, if you want a little sidebar message, go read Psalm 81 and see how God promises to provide honey from a rock. He does the impossible for those who love him. And look at verse 26. For to a person who is good in his sight, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, while to the sinner he has given the task of gathering and collecting so that he may give to the one who is good in God's sight. And this too is vanity and striving after wind. Now, Solomon makes a promise for those who are good in God's sight. Later on in Ecclesiastes, chapter 7, verse 20, he's going to tell us that everybody sins. 
And yet he set up a contrast between those who are good in God's sight and the sinner, a participle, literally, the, the one who goes on missing the mark. Here, these are categories of people. The one who is good in God's sight is the one who has oriented his life Godward. And the sinner is a categorical description of those who reject God and continue in their own way of living. And notice it is God in this verse who gives. God is the one in charge. The created order is not in charge. Man trying to eke out of the created order the things he wants to try to get apart from God. Man's not in charge. God's in charge. And to the one good in his sight, he gives. Listen, friends, you must know our God is not stingy. (laughs) The world and, and all of its good things are not there for us to recognize that we can't have them because God is mean. No, God is a good God who gives good gifts. And here, specifically, he gives wisdom and knowledge and joy. By the way, recognizing that wisdom and knowledge are gifts is so helpful. Ecclesiastes 2 is something of a study in epistemology. That is the study of knowledge. How is it that we know what we know? And there are really two kinds of knowers, two kinds of epistemologists, dependent and independent knowers. Right? The independent knower says, I'm going to use my resources and try to figure things out on my own. Whichever way it seems best to me, that's what I'm going to do. The dependent knower says, I'm a creature, and God's the creator. If I'm to know anything, I must subject my thoughts to his thoughts. I must think his thoughts after him. His ways are higher than my ways. He has infinite wisdom, infinite knowledge. I'm a puny-brained creature. I need him. <laughs> And to those who are good in his sight, God graciously gives wisdom and knowledge. And look at the third gift, joy. A gift from God. Not just the gifts where joy could be found, but also the capacity to enjoy them. It's an endowment from our creator. Withheld from the sinner, given freely to the one good in his sight. What does God give to the sinner? The task of gathering and collecting so that he may give to the one good in his sight. Three infinitives in a row. He gives to the sinner to gather, to collect, to give it all up. The sinner's plight is hevel, vanity. That's what Solomon concludes. This too is vanity and striving after a wind. He's not saying that God giving good gifts to those who are good in his sight is striving after wind. He has his focus here on the man trying to get satisfaction apart from God. And he said, in contrast, the sinner is in a frustrating capacity, as one writer put it, of amassing what you cannot keep. What a frustrating business. You live your life independently, apart from God, you will never get what you seek. You live your life dependently. You'll get more than you ever dreamed. Do I want wisdom and joy without God? I will get nothing. But if I want God, I get everything. There are a couple of important questions for us to think through. Uh, One of them is this. How do I become good in God's sight? How how do I get into that category Solomon is describing? I mean, I'm, I'm not good. And if you're here this morning and you think you're pretty good, um, you, you need to read your Bible. You need to see yourself the way God sees you. You need to understand your thoughts and your intentions and your motives, your attitudes, your behaviors, your very nature through God's eyes. To fail to do that will be to die in ignorance and rebellion. But to catch a glimpse of who you really are, Hopeless, helpless, dead, in need is a first step toward having life and having everything. So how is a sinner made right before a holy God? How how is someone who has committed the crimes you and I have committed fall into this category of being good in his sight? Well, my friends, there's only one way. There's only one way. God has sent his own son And you know his name, Jesus, the one who is greater than Solomon, to the earth. 
to live under the curse we all live under, though he never sinned. He went to a cross, an implement of torture and execution. And he hung on a cross between man and God, cruelly tortured and punished by men, but then before his God, enduring the wrath of Almighty God against all the sins of everyone who would ever believe, past, present, and future, so that he might absorb the wrath of his Father and absolve the sins of those who believe, so that the guilty go free and get labeled with this category to be good in God's sight. Not good inherently, but good in his sight, declared righteous, forgiven, It's the only way. It's the only way to have life. It's the only way to have satisfaction and fulfillment is God's way. To be rightly related to him through the death of his son, through Jesus' resurrection and new life, to be made a new creature, to belong to him. There's another question we should ask. When does this take place? I mean, when do I get Bertrand Russell's stuff? When do I get Voltaire's barn and figure out if any of the rusty trinkets in there are worth something on Antiques Roadshow? Solomon says that God will give to the one who's good in his sight all the things that the sinners spent their whole lives futilely collecting and gathering. It may be in Solomon's context in a a theocracy where God's man reigned as king and the, the Bible was the constitution. Maybe in the, the heyday and the golden age of Israel's theocracy, it, it may have been more true than now that the righteous lived longer, blessed lives and, and the turn of affairs happened in a temporal circumstance, that, that the wicked get found out, their sin found them out and their fortunes are overturned and dispensed to those who love God. Maybe that was true to some degree in Solomon's day. Maybe. But I think this text is forcing us to think bigger than this life. To garner an eternal perspective that frankly changes everything. The real truth of this reversal takes place in eternity. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 19. I want you to see this. There's a parable from the lips of Jesus describing this great reversal. And I'll just read it to you, beginning in verse 11 of Luke 19. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called ten of his slaves, and he gave them ten minas, and said to them, Do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him. They sent a delegation after him, saying, We don't want this man to reign over us. And when he returned, after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that these slaves, to whom he had given the money, be called to him, so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared, saying, Master, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, well done, good slave, because you have been faithful in a very little thing. You are to be in authority over ten cities. The second came, saying, Your mina, master, has made five minas. And he said to him also, You are to be over five cities. And another came, saying, Master, here is your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief, for I was afraid of you because you are an exacting man. You take up what you did not lay down, reap what you do not sow. And he said to him, By your own words, I will judge you. You worthless slave. Did you not know that I am an exacting man taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why did you not put my money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. Then he said to the bystanders, take the mina away from him and give it to the one who has the ten. And they said to him, Master, he has ten minas already. I tell you that to everyone who has, more shall be given but from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine, 
who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. Really a terrifying parable about the great reversal that happens at the return of Jesus Christ. That those who have taken God's commodities, His good gifts, and squandered them, not used them for His glory, have not used them for His increase. They have toiled in vain, they have labored in vain, and will end up giving all that they toiled for over to Him. And God will dispense to His own. God will give to the one to whom He has already given. This is a truth reflected in other parts of Scripture. Matthew 6.33, Jesus simply said, Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Matthew 5, 5, happy are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. To be an inheritor of all those good things that the world went after apart from God, we get because we pursue Him. You can write down Matthew 24, 45 to 47. What do we learn here? God is not stingy. <laughs> He's not in the business of withholding that which is good. He's in the business of preparing us for eternity for that which is good. We are not to have it in its totality here in a broken and cursed world. We're not to have it in our present state. Solomon is driving us in Ecclesiastes 2 to an eternal perspective. And I'd like to steal an illustration of eternity from Thomas Watson, not the golfer, uh, the 17th century Puritan theologian. He compared eternity to this, imagine that the whole earth that we live on is sand entirely, from the atmosphere down to the very center, uh, just one big orb of sand. And imagine that every thousand years, a tiny bird flies to the earth, picks up a tenth of a grain of sand, and flies it away to some far off place and deposits it. A thousand years later, comes back for another tenth of a grain of sand and flies back and deposits it. And when all of that sand had been transported from this place to that place, over how many countless thousands of years, eternity will have only just begun. Do you understand? We were not meant to be at home here. We were built, created, designed to transcend this life. And if you have doubled down on the gamble that life is to be had here, that meaning is to be found only here, that life's purpose and fulfillment and satisfaction are to be found apart from God, and that you alone of all people are the one to find it, my friend, that is a bad gamble. You can have everything by going to the one who is the provider of everything. Solomon is driving us to this truth. What is the result for our toil and labor in this life? I love Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. He says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Do you hear all those Ecclesiastes words in 1 Corinthians 15? Paul knew Solomon's thoughts. Paul picked up Solomon's theme and drives it home for us. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word, for the recalibration of our hearts that happens when we come to it. We thank you that you are our great God and you are the one who is the fountain of all delights, the one who promised that at your right hand are pleasures forevermore that you have promised good, infinite good for all who love you. You have promised to make your tabernacle among us, that you would dwell with us and we would be called your people and you yourself would be our God. You promised that the one who overcomes would inherit all these things and you would be his God and he would be your son. You promised that there would no longer be any curse. The throne of God and and of the Lamb will be in that new city, in that new heavens and new earth. 
and your slaves will serve you, and they will see your face, and your name will be on our foreheads, and there will no longer be any night, and we will have no need of the lamp or light of the sun, because you, our God, will illuminate it all, and we will reign forever and ever.